Today, on our second special of 2019, I'm kicking off my trip to the White Mountains. And over the next four parts, I'll be heading to the easternmost part of Arizona to spend some time in the White Mountains. Known for its high elevation, cool rivers, and pristine meadows, this part of Arizona is truly one of the best and most unexpected parts of the state. Over this series, I'll be doing some four-wheel drive exploring, taking scenic drives, and camping throughout the gorgeous Apache Sitgreaves Forest in the area around Big Lake and west of the town of Alpine. Along the way, I'll be treated to scenic vistas, historic homesteads and old mines, and deal with some vehicle issues as I traverse over 600 miles in six days. This is the White Mountain Special. Hello everybody and welcome to another AZ Off-Road special. I'm Scotty and as you can see, Daniel is not here. He actually already flew out earlier this year to join us on our Arizona Peace Trail special. That was through Western Arizona. Today I am heading the opposite direction. I'm going to Eastern Arizona on a solo trip into the White Mountains. Now this is gonna be a four part series but I'm actually spending six days total including a day to drive up and a day to drive back. Now right now I am almost halfway to the White Mountains just a little before the Salt River Canyon and I'm stopped here at Seneca Lake. There's some abandoned buildings here and there's a nice little lake down there. I'm stopped here real quick before I continue on down the road to the end of an old forest road. There I hope to check out an old mine I'm hoping to find a nice place to camp for the night and then tomorrow morning we'll be right back out here on the highway and continue on up to the White Mountains where we'll be spending the next five days. Should be a real nice time. Just going to kind of take it a little bit easier, relax, cruise through the forest, find some great views, find some nice creeks to look at and overall just enjoy the time up in this true gem of eastern Arizona. My journey begins here, just off Highway 60, about 30 miles north of Globe and just south of the Salt River Canyon. Right off the highway sits the abandoned buildings at Seneca Lake. This set of buildings are easily visible from the main thoroughfare that connects Sholo and Globe. However, not many people know much about it and even fewer stop to check it out. These buildings were built in 1971 for around $525,000. The land is owned by the San Carlos Apache tribe. The idea was to create a resort, complete with a restaurant, trading post, gas station, and campground, all located just steps away from the small but scenic Seneca Lake. Not long after completion, however, the tribe defaulted on the loan that was used to build the resort, and almost as quickly as it sprung up, the buildings here were abandoned and left in a state of disrepair. It is unclear whether a lack of visitors caused the failure of what was surely a nice place at one point. And in fact, the tribe was even considering expanding it at one point before it closed down. Today, the buildings remain heavily graffitied and trashed. They are certainly interesting to walk through. However, an eerie feeling remains on the property today. This quick stop, however, was only the start of my side trip here at Seneca Lake. I returned to the Jeep and continued down the paved road, which soon turned to dirt just past the lake. My plan for today was to continue about 8 miles down the trail to the end of an old forest road, and hopefully spend some time exploring a couple of old mines near Regal Canyon, before ultimately finding a place to camp near the rim of Salt River Canyon. This turnoff here at Seneca roughly marks the halfway point between Phoenix and the White Mountains. 
Since I would be doing less than 10 miles of trail and needed to be back to the highway early tomorrow, I decided not to air down for this stretch. Past to the lake, the trail remained flat and smooth as I crossed into Tonto National Forest. The forest here was still pretty low elevation, around 4,500 feet, and smaller shrubs and trees aligned the trail. Within just a couple of miles though, the scenery changed. The view opened up as I approached the rim of the wide Salt River Canyon. Here, steep cliffs and hints of a few old tailings piles greeted me. It was clear I was approaching one of the two mining areas I wanted to check out today. The trail followed along the cliffs and got briefly narrow. Shortly after, the trail flattened back out and continued to the west. Just after the three mile mark, I approached a small gated off clearing. At this clearing used to sit the remains of the Phillips Mine. Phillips Mine was a small asbestos mine, and yes, you did hear that right. A little more on that later. Several buildings sat here at one point, but were apparently raised due to health and safety concerns possibly having something to do with the asbestos material that it was built with. Since most of the mining took place further off the trail, and it seemed like it was gated and fenced off pretty well, I had to continue on. Back on the trail, the road continued to the west and slowly climbed. Eventually, things topped out at around 5,000 feet. The scenery, however, remained pretty flat and densely covered with shrubs and trees. After a few more miles, the trail dropped down a fairly steep hill. The road was also moderately washed out in spots, which reduced my pace as I continued west towards the Regal Mine. This section was quite short and nothing crazy by any means, but it was a nice change of pace from the otherwise fast moving miles thus far. Not long after the rougher section, the road turned back smooth. It continued to drop downhill as it made a long curve to the right. Within a quarter mile of the Regal Mine ruins, I came to what has to be one of the worst things you can find on a trail out in the backcountry. A locked and gated off-road. Apparently, in the few years since I had been to the property, ownership has changed and public access has been cut off. Unfortunately, and rather frustratingly, there had been no warning along the drive-in that the trail was closed so close to the mine ruins and buildings located at Regal Canyon. And with only one way in and out of the property, which is located in a fairly steep canyon, there was no easy way to get eyes on what is left today. There was, however, another way. Getting an aerial perspective of the property would allow me to at least get eyes on any ruins there might be and see what kind of condition they're left in today. And of course, this is perfectly legal. From the air, it didn't take long to see just how much of the Regal Mine has been relatively untouched in the years since it closed down. The Regal was first operated by the Arizona Asbestos Company in the late 1930s up until around 1945. The mine was most profitable in 1941 and 42, producing over $50,000 in ore. Around 15 people worked at the mine at that time using diesel generators and compressors. 
a reliable water source had been secured, although the rugged terrain made mining efforts rather difficult. The mine shut down for a brief time before being reopened under new ownership in the mid-1950s. Up to 50 people at a time worked the mine throughout the 1960s. Ore was hauled 30 miles from the mine site, back to the paved road and down to a mill and globe where the ore was further refined and sent off to market. The mine closed down sometime around 1970 due to the lack of high grade ore. So yes, this mine produced asbestos. Unlike other major mines throughout the state that produce gold and silver or even copper, this one is certainly unique. Now the asbestos that was mined here was found in naturally occurring serpentine and chrysolite, which is actually really abundant in this area. The longer fibers that were found in these kind of rocks, while still dangerous, were used in the construction industry for things like insulation, plaster, and even gas mask filters. As part of the mining process, these rocks and fibers were inevitably broken down into smaller, more dangerous pieces that required special considerations for those working in the mine at the time. It wouldn't be until much later that asbestos was even recognized and considered dangerous, and to this day, the United States does still allow it to be used in certain industries. Numerous structures remain on the property at the Regal today. On the south end, several different sized buildings remain in the creek bottom. Some have collapsed over the last few years. About five years ago, before the property was gated, I did manage to take a quick walk around this area and the pictures you are seeing now are some of those buildings from a few years back. They appear to be some kind of house or living space of some kind. From the aerial view, it appears that this building has actually since collapsed. Perhaps much more impressive are the tailing piles and haulage tracks that remain near the mine adits. Located further north along the steeper walls of the canyon, these are precariously balanced with waste rock dumped down into the ravine. They appear to be in surprisingly good condition today, although actually getting to them would prove to be very difficult due to their location on the canyon walls. Unfortunately, this was pretty much all there is to see from this vantage point. It turns out, the mine is actually for sale and you can buy it for a cool 230000 bucks. Which if you do, let me know because I'd love to come out and get a better look. I turned around on the trail and continued back up the way I came. Roughly a mile from the Regal Mine Gate, I turned off the main road and headed west. The trail quickly passed through an old corral as it swung to the north. The plan now was to head to my planned camping area just ahead on the edge of the Salt River Canyon. The trail quickly got narrow and much rougher. Past the corral, it is clear that not many people have been on this trail. After crawling along in some fresh Arizona pinstriping, I made it to a clearing roughly a mile later. I parked the jeep and hopped out on foot to check out the view. Looking down into the Salt River Canyon was nothing short of breathtaking. The river, now almost 1500 feet below my elevation, silently flowed off in the distance. The towering canyon walls were also quite impressive. Just to the east of me were some more remnants from the Regal Mine that I hadn't been able to see earlier from the main road. With a nice cleared area and a more than okay view, I figured this was too good of a camp spot to pass up. While it was still a bit early due to the unplanned gate closure, I had already covered all of my planned miles for the day. I popped open the tent and quickly got my cooking gear set up. 
The weather was a little warm, but remained mostly mild as I sat down to enjoy the view for a while. It was at this point I couldn't help but notice a large plume to my west. This was the smoke plume from the Woodbury fire burning in the Superstition Wilderness. While I was over 50 air miles away from the actual fire, the plume was easily visible and with the prevailing winds shifting, much of it was actually drifting this way. I fired up the stove and got started on an early dinner. Tonight was going to be some barbecued chicken and rice. It cooked up nice and quick and I sat down to eat with an epic view. As the evening wore on, the smoke was getting much thicker. The sun was now an eerie blood red color and a little bit of ash was even falling from the sky. While I knew I was more than a safe distance away, it was still a pretty weird experience. Naturally, the sunset put on quite a show, and the smoke-filled canyon made for some really unique visuals. Not long after 8pm, the sun was finally down and I crawled up into the tent. Today had been a fairly long day and I wanted to be up nice and early tomorrow morning to get a good jump on the rest of the drive up into the White Mountains. It was around 5.30 the next morning when I was up and around. I had slept great. The night was quiet and perfectly still, and leaving all of the window screens open in the tent had been a good call. It was actually so quiet that when I woke up this morning, I could actually hear the Salt River thundering below. After getting dressed, I got my gear out of the tent and quickly packed it up. I wanted to get out of here quick this morning. Next up was breakfast. I'd be keeping it simple this morning in order to save time. I got some water boiling for oatmeal and coffee. I'd be trying my new French press on this trip, which seemed like it would be a great addition for some quick and easy caffeination. Within minutes, breakfast was ready to go and I had a nice hot cup of coffee to enjoy. I quickly packed up the remaining gear into the Jeep and made sure camp was all cleaned up. By 6.45, I was completely packed up and ready to hit the trail, which I think may be a new easy off-road record. Okay, we are leaving our first night's camp, going to head back to Highway 60 now, but I am really glad that I ended up staying the night here. Uh, last night it was a little weird with the, the haze and all the smoke from the wildfire pretty far down the, the way there. But throughout the night, it was super still, just calm, very mild temperatures, um, stayed plenty warm. And then waking up this morning to that incredible view was pretty awesome. So I'm glad I picked here. Um, we do have about eight miles to go of trail to get back to the highway, but we're gonna do that now. And then we'll be actually descending into Salt River Canyon and heading up through Sholo, and then finally into the White Mountains. I retraced my route from yesterday as I continued south on the faint and narrow tracks.
I passed through the dilapidated corral, and to my surprise, a cattle trailer had just been parked there this morning. I continued back up the washed out hill, and was quickly back on smooth and fast moving forest roads. The views were once again impressive along the cliffs, and before I knew it, I was back at the still waters of Seneca Lake. The lake has camping and fishing opportunities available, but if you do plan on that, you will need a permit to recreate on the reservation. Past the abandoned buildings at Seneca, I was back on Highway 60 and northbound. The road quickly drops into the scenic Salt River Canyon, and the drive is stunning. On the other side of the river, the road climbs towards Sholo. Within a couple of hours, I was outside of Pine Top, and I topped off the tank and ice chest. I continued along 260, and at last, I turned south towards Big Lake and into the heart of the White Mountains. The highway here was over 8,000 feet, and wide open meadows and thick forests greeted me around every bend. I stopped off at Crescent Lake for a quick break and to grab a quick snack. Crescent Lake is one of three high mountain lakes in the area. Despite being so close to Big Lake, just a couple miles away, this spot is surprisingly secluded. Elk bugled in the distance and hundreds of vibrant blue dragonflies lined the shore. In the distance was Mount Baldy, the second highest point in Arizona outside of the Flagstaff area, the highest sections of which were still covered in snow. Mount Baldy climbs up to 11,400 feet and by far is the highest point in all of the White Mountains. If you're into fishing, this would definitely be a place you want to check out, although it also makes for a great spot to stop and enjoy the view. After a quick break at Crescent Lake, I continued briefly along the paved road. Just a few miles later, I had made it back onto dirt roads and headed south on Forest Road 24. The road was wide and washboardy, but filled with all kinds of green colors. A few miles in, I branched off the main road and turned left onto some lesser forest roads. Even though I'd be on dirt for around the next three to four days, I stayed aired up at this point. Continuing east now, the trail was much narrower and bumpier. Despite it being midweek, the area already had quite a few people camped out in the different clearings. If you visit the White Mountains, this will likely be a common theme as the area is very popular for all kinds of outdoor enthusiasts. I made a hard left turn onto an even more isolated road and began to climb. This spur trail would switch back even higher into the forest as I made my way up Big Lake Knoll. The trail was easy to moderate, and I shortly found myself parked at the summit. Now over 9400 feet, the 360 degree panorama was breathtaking, both figuratively and literally. The surrounding view offered a glimpse at the open expanse of the Apache Sitgreaves National Forest as well as the lakes I had just passed. Mount Baldy rose up to the west and Escudia Mountain to the east. It was here on this summit where a fire tower was built in 1933 by the Civilian Conservation Corps. That tower, however, is noticeably not here anymore. The tower and much of the surrounding area was burned by the devastating wall of fire that ripped through this area back in 2011. The forest is slowly recovering, however, the fire damage is still extremely noticeable and would be seen throughout my entire trip. Only a few cement foundations remain today where the tower once stood. I grabbed lunch at the summit and admired the view. 
The weather was cool and mild. It was absolutely perfect. This point, as far as I know, marks the highest I had ever driven my Jeep in the state. So that was cool. It was now after 1 o'clock and I wanted to get back on the trail. Before getting underway, I decided to air down the tires real quick because I would pretty much be on dirt roads for the next four days. I headed back down the mountain on the narrow trail as it switched back back into the forest. It was really incredible just how green this section was. At the bottom of the hill, I worked my way back to Forest Road 24 and eventually continued south. Back on the fast moving road, it didn't take long for me to reach my next turnoff. The road split again and I stayed onto a lesser forest road to the right. Staying left, Forest Road 24 continues to Buffalo Crossing where it meets up with the East Fork of the Black River and other trail junctions. I'd be checking that area out in a couple of days, but for now, I wanted to see what was off on this side trail. The couple of miles along this section were certainly more isolated. The road was more washed out and more catered to high clearance vehicles, meaning it doesn't see as much traffic as the other roads I had been on. It did seem exceptionally dry along this section though. The seasonal streams that can occasionally flow through here were empty and it just didn't seem as green. Nevertheless, after only a couple of miles, the trail dumped me at Forest Road 25, just west of Buffalo Crossing. I continued on to the west. Now back on easy and smooth forest roads, I soon passed over the west fork of the Black River. The west fork originates higher up in the White Mountains near Mount Baldy. After twisting and turning its way through different meadows, it eventually crosses underneath this bridge and flows south, where not far from here, it converges with the east fork. In total, the Black River flows 114 miles to the south and west, where it eventually meets up with the White River, and that eventually ends up in the Salt River, so really makes quite a journey as the water can reach as far as Phoenix, which is pretty much due west of this area. The cool water is popular with anglers and hikers, and makes for a relaxing spot to spend any amount of time. I would hopefully be camping along its banks, just a couple miles upstream later tonight. I pushed west as the forest briefly thinned, and I crossed through a couple of gorgeous meadows. This change of scenery was nice, and the trail remained smooth as I trucked along. I passed the turnoff for Caldwell Cabin, which is another rentable forest cabin that I have stayed in the past, which I would recommend checking out if it's available. On this trip, however, I'd be sticking to camping. After a few more miles, I turned north and briefly climbed before crossing the West Fork again. I pulled into West Fork Campground and followed it back, hoping to find a pristine spot for the night. West Fork Campground is an undeveloped area with several free sites scattered along the banks of the Black River. It features primitive bathrooms and fire rings, but that's about it as far as amenities go. About half of the campground is closed past the river crossing due to fire damage, but that's okay because at around 3pm I had found the perfect spot. I parked the jeep at the furthest point in the campground, just to the right of the vehicle barricades. I was extremely fortunate to be the only one in the campground for now. My campsite was located just feet away from the babbling river. With the river on one side and a thick forested hill on the other, this spot was surprisingly isolated for being in a campground. I got the tent opened up and slowly worked on getting the rest of camp ready. Because it was still early in the afternoon, I was able to take it easy and enjoy the sights and sounds, which there was no shortage of. After the sun was almost down, I got to work on dinner. Tonight would be burgers. 
or burger, I suppose, since I was only making one. Dinner cooked up quick and was paired with a nice beer. Once it had finally gotten darker, I got to work on a fire. The fire ring was really the only thing that was provided at this campsite. After getting the fire going and some whiskey poured, it was now time to relax. The crackling of the fire, mixed with the river flowing nearby, proved to be the perfect combo. Today had been productive, driving nearly 200 miles from my campsite north of Globe and getting into the White Mountains for a nice relaxing day. Underneath a vibrant night sky, the fire died down and I eventually made it up into the tent around 10 o'clock. The sound of the Black River lulled me right to sleep. Eleven hours later, I was finally up and around. I had slept fantastic last night in what might have been the most relaxing night of camping in my life. The weather had dipped into the mid 40s, but overall wasn't too bad. I took a quick stroll over to the river. Yep, still relaxing. It would be extremely hard to leave this campsite. After getting the tent packed away, I started on a late breakfast, or I guess an early brunch. Oatmeal was accompanied by an over easy egg, and of course, the obligatory cup of coffee. After a bite to eat, I got to work on cleaning up the rest of camp and loading the jeep. I made sure my campfire was dead out, thanks to a little help from the nearby water source. It should go without saying, but always check and follow the local restrictions, and no matter what, make sure your campfire is cool to the touch before leaving. In a remote place like this, a fire can, as evidenced by the past, do some serious damage. With the Jeep now loaded up and some more traffic coming into the campground to access the river, it was time to get rolling. I drove south a few miles out of the campground, back across the West Fork, and eventually back to Forest Road 25. I turned right to continue east on the wide road. The plan for the day was to follow 25 all the way around, past Wildcat Point to its southern terminus near Hannigan Meadow. It was set to be another relaxing day, with a couple of stops at scenic viewpoints and a historic lookout tower. After a couple miles, I detoured off the main road and continued south. Before heading on the rest of the drive, I wanted to try and find an old fire tower that's in the area. The lookout was a little out of the way, but figured I had the time to do a little exploring. Plus, these trails were a little bit rougher, so it would add a little fun to the day as well. The trail meandered southeast as it passed through some sparse forest and beautiful meadows. It was really quite scenic and there was no other traffic so far. After around a mile, I stayed left onto Forest Road 555 and continued uphill towards the lookout. The trail quickly got rougher. The surface was rocky and had seen some erosion. I kept the Jeep in 4 high as the road twisted and climbed. Things got quite steep and a little tippy. This was by far the roughest trail I had been on so far. Eventually, the trail led up as it crested the hill and arrived at the top. Not only did I find a lookout tower, but there was also a cabin and a few other structures, which was a pleasant surprise. I parked the Jeep and hopped out on foot. This fire tower is called P.S. Knoll Lookout. 
It was built in 1933 and features a 50 foot tall aero motor tower with a 7 by 7 foot platform at the top. The tower looked to be in incredible shape. It didn't seem like anyone was on duty, so I decided to climb up the tower. After several flights of stairs, I made it to the base of the tower. Unfortunately, a locked door at the top kept me from going all the way up. Nevertheless, the view from up here was pretty incredible. Located at just over 8,000 feet, this lookout offers another commanding view of the remote stretch of forest. Back on the ground, I walked around the outside of the old cabin. It was also locked, although the door looked like it had been vandalized. The inside was pretty bare and dusty. The property also had an outhouse and some kind of shed out back. It was really quite an impressive setup. It is unclear if the lookout is still staffed today, although since everything appeared to be in decent shape, it could be used on an as needed basis. I returned to the Jeep and started back downhill. I carefully picked my line on the way back down. Halfway down from the lookout, I couldn't help but notice an unusual sound coming from outside of my Jeep. Every so often, I would hear a pss sound. After further investigation, I discovered that my left front had developed some kind of leak. At this point, I couldn't tell how bad it was, but the tires still appeared inflated, at least for now. I bombed my way back downhill, trying to get closer to Forest Road 25. Speed did not help as the more the tire rotated, the more air it seemed to lose. Just a couple of miles later, I pulled into a clearing to assess the damage. It didn't look too good. I checked the pressure and it had dropped to a whopping 4 pounds. I had been aired down since yesterday afternoon. But that was only down to about 15 to 18 pounds. I could have changed the tire right here and now, and I probably should have, but I figured I would air it back up and see if it would hold for a little while. I wanted to at least get further down the trail and hopefully to my intended campsite, that way I could leisurely change the tire and set up camp in the same spot. My plans to do the loop down along the Forest Road 25 would unfortunately have to be scratched. My intended campsite wasn't too far to the east, but I wanted to get as close as I could. I aired the tire back up to 20 pounds and it seemed to be holding air. As I got rolling back to Forest Road 25, I checked the tire and it still looked alright. I continued to the east, but it soon became clear that this wasn't going to work. Every time the tire spun, it let out some air. I was forced to air up again on the side of the road as the tire had dipped back down to around 5 pounds. And this game continued over the next few miles. I'd air the tire up, then continue down the trail for roughly a mile and a half, and then it'd be flat again. It happened again, and again, and eventually I got tired of it. So the tire situation was a little bit worse than I thought, and I'm actually pulled over here. I'm going to have to change it right now. I was able to get maybe a mile to a mile and a half each time I aired up. It was just every time that wheel spins, pss, 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 it's just letting air out. And 
the faster I went, the more it let air out. So there was no way I could make it last for any longer. And frankly, I got tired of airing up about three or four times. So I'm pulled over here in a kind of a nice shady spot off the main road. Gonna have to uh, pull out all our gear, which should be fun because uh, it's buried underneath the cooler and camera gear. But uh, I'm gonna get to that and uh, hopefully we can get this tire changed quick. This is my first official kind of like out on a trip tire change, so it should be fun. Parked in a nice shady spot off the busy road, I got to work on changing the tire. The first order of business was getting to my tools, which of course were buried underneath the rear seats. Next up, I had to free my spare tire. It turns out the socket that I bought specifically for changing tires didn't actually fit the lugs on the spare. Luckily, the factory lug wrench, which I still had underneath the seat, fit the spare tire. Otherwise, I would have been screwed. Definitely a little bit of oversight on my part. With the Jeep still on the ground, I loosened the front lug nuts before chalking the rear tires and getting the jack in place. Using some wood supports, I was able to raise the Jeep up and loosen up the flat tire. From the clean spot it made on the tire, you can see roughly where my leak was coming from, which seemed like it was right where the sidewall meets the tread. With the old tire off, I put my spare on. I put on the lug nuts and snugged them up. I also needed my locking lug key. I knew I left it around here somewhere. Ah, there it is. Don't want to lose that. I lowered the Jeep back down to the ground and gave everything a final tighten. Lastly, I aired the new tire back down to trail pressure and I was ready to go. All in all, the whole process took around 30 minutes, which isn't too bad considering I had to shuffle a bunch of gear and get the right tools in place. It was now around 3.30. There was still a decent amount of daylight left, so I wanted to do some more exploring, but with no spare left, I would have to take it a bit easier. Continuing east, I soon reached Buffalo Crossing, where Forest Road 25 meets 24 at the East Fork of the Black River. Heading south from there, the views opened up in a wide meadow. The trails remained smooth. Five miles south, the road climbed sharply. Things got narrower and entered into some of the worst parts of the Wallow Fire burn area. The wall of fire was caused by two campers and burned out of control for over a month back in 2011. In all, over 530,000 acres or 800 square miles were burned. This part here saw some of the worst damage and won't fully recover for many decades. It was really crazy to see how much the fire burned. I turned around at this point and set out to find a campsite. The road was fun to drive and even had a little bit of water in some spots.
The campsite I had planned on originally staying at had already been claimed by some other people. I did manage to find an incredible view of the Black River though. This section was exceptionally rocky with steep ledges along the river banks. After retracing some of my route from earlier, I eventually settled on a nice forest camp spot not far from where I changed my tire. It was now 6 o'clock and I worked on getting camp set up. I played with the tent annex a little bit, but after a while came to the conclusion that it's too much of a hassle and adds too much time to the setup and tear down time. Dinner tonight was going to be super quick. I was tired from the day, which had turned out quite differently than planned. It was grilled cheese and beer, and it was delicious. After watching the sunset, it was off to bed. Coyotes off in the distance serenaded me right to sleep. The next morning at around 8, I was awake and refreshed. I got some quick breakfast going, which was going to be oatmeal and of course coffee. The night had been pretty cool, but fortunately a little bit warmer than the previous night. I took a quick walk over to a nearby corral. The corral was pretty dilapidated and overgrown, but was quite extensive. At some point in the past, a bunch of animals were stored in the different pens. Some kind of old trailer remained near the loading station. After this, I packed up camp and got ready to hit the trail once again. I returned to the trail junction at Buffalo Crossing. From here, I picked up Forest Road 276. This trail follows along the East Fork of the Black River. It has numerous campgrounds and lots of traffic, so don't expect to find any solitude along this section. But the views are something else. The road meandered uphill through a narrow canyon, and at certain points, I was driving just feet away from the flowing river. At one of the many campgrounds, I took the opportunity to top off my water tanks before continuing on. There are a few spots where you can get free water, but most of the campgrounds do charge a fee. Past the river, the road climbs out of the canyon and traverses some rather thick forest. Thirteen miles from Buffalo Crossing, I made it to a paved road. From here, you have the option of staying right to get to the town of Alpine, or staying left to get back to Big Lake. I'd be going left, but only for about half a mile since my next trail was just up to my north. Because this was only a short pavement stretch, I wouldn't need to air up. Almost as quickly as I was on pavement, I was soon turning back onto the dirt road for another couple days of exploring. Now back on the dirt road, I stayed north onto Forest Road 88B. The trail continued to climb. Despite passing a large group camped out along the trail, things seemed pretty secluded. There was evidence of some road grading going on, but things remained rocky and washboardy for a while. Eventually, things topped out around 8800 feet as the trail passed through a wet marsh area. Here, the landscape was a rich green and puddles of water remained in the various tanks. It was really something. The trail continued downhill as it slowly dropped in elevation. 
After another mile or so, I met up with Forest Road 88 and headed to the west. The trail along this section was downright gorgeous. Some more open views and even some elk greeted me as I passed along Rogers Marsh. The road remained mostly easy as the scenery changed yet again. This time, a large, wide meadow appeared to my left. This section wasn't quite as green as the few miles before, but there was still some water flowing in the lower parts. The wind had picked up through this open section. Off on the left was the ruins of another remote corral. This one, however, was unique and appeared to be built completely of wooded posts. Five miles from my last trail junction, I came to another trail intersection. My planned route would be taking me to the right and further north, however, there was a view that I had to check out to the left. Just to the south, I stopped at Crosby Spring. Located in the lowest part of the wide meadow, a small stream flows underneath the road. And the view? Well, it was incredible. Like something out of a postcard. Even though it was windy, a slight trickle of water made for a nice, relaxing spot. I decided to grab some lunch here and enjoy the view for a while. It was just too good to pass up. Once back on the trail, I continued northbound. The trail wound through some dense forest as it resumed climbing. The thick forest gave way to rolling grasslands. The road became extremely smooth along this section as it again reached over 9300 feet in elevation. The wind gusted strongly. Rolling hills and even the upper reaches of Mount Baldy peaked above the horizon. A few miles further north, the trail had re-entered the forest. Along a side trail, I reached my destination, an old homestead located in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, very little is actually known about this spot. Historic maps of this area describe this location as some kind of old guard station or cabin associated with the forest service. Beyond that, there is really nothing known about this site. There were a decent amount of ruins that hadn't yet been claimed by the forest. A fireplace, shed, numerous fences, and other random pieces lay on the grassy floor. It seemed like a really nice place at some point. I can only begin to imagine the lifestyle that the owners who lived here experienced on this remote plot of land. It seems remote nowadays, but back when this place was functioning, you really had to be on your own. By four, I had left the homestead site and explored the area a little further. The forest roads across the Saffle OHV loop, which seemed like it would have been a great ride if I had my ATV with me. After making it nearly to Eager, I headed back south to find camp for the night. Today was extremely windy, so I would need to find a spot relatively tucked away for the night. Crossed back over my new favorite spot near Crosby Spring, and eventually found a secluded spot near an Aspen Grove. It was a great little spot. There were no big views, but the shade and relative quietness was nice. Once camp was set up, I began on dinner. Tonight would be something a little different. After some water was boiled, I got the spaghetti going. With the sauce warmed up and the noodles buttered, dinner was ready in no time. Sometimes it's the simple meals or the ones you wouldn't think about making that can really be a hit when you're out camping. With dinner done, I enjoyed the sunset. 
Not long after, I found myself back up in the tent and ready to hit the hay. The next morning, I was slow to get up and around. The surrounding forest had kept my campsite pretty well in the shade for most of the morning. Today was the first day that I didn't really have a set plan. I was considering staying the night in the same spot, actually. I got working on a little more involved breakfast than the past couple of days. It wasn't very healthy, but it did taste pretty good. The next few hours were spent lounging around camp. It was kind of nice to do absolutely nothing. After sitting around camp for a while, I eventually got bored. So I decided to pack it up and try to find a different, more secluded spot. I continued back north up the road and eventually passed over Crosby Spring. Eventually, I made it back to Forest Road 88, where I had spent some time driving down yesterday. This trail had proved to be one of the more scenic in the White Mountains so far. I felt confident I could find a good spot somewhere along its length. Within a couple of miles of easy cruising, I pulled off the main road and quickly found the perfect spot. This shady spot would be perfect for my last night of camping. It was fairly level and had a slightly overgrown fire ring. It's clear that someone has definitely camped here before, but it's been some time. I got the tent opened up for the last time on this trip and got my gear in place. A quick walk around revealed that this area was much more scenic than my last campsite. A lush green meadow was located a quick walk away from my camp. At this point, I was glad I had packed it up and headed for this area. The elevation was around 9,000 feet, but luckily, the weather was mild and not overly windy right now. Back at camp, it was dinner time. I fired up the stove and got some chicken warmed and seasoned up. Next, it was time for a tortilla and cheese. Tonight would be chicken quesadillas, another simple staple. With the cheese melted and paired in what can only be described as the perfect combo, I sat down to enjoy. It was absolutely delicious. So good in fact, I had to make another. With darkness creeping in, I dug the fire pit out. Although the ground was fairly wet in this area, I was eventually able to get a campfire started. The surrounding area showed evidence of wildfire, so I would be keeping things small and under control. I sipped on some more whiskey as I sat to enjoy my last night in the White Mountains. After things eventually simmered down, I retreated to the tent. It was a fairly chilly night, but I managed to bundle up inside the tent.
the next morning, I was up at a decent time. I had a long highway drive back home today, plus some additional forest roads to cover, so I would need to get rolling fairly soon. I got a simple breakfast prepared and enjoyed the view. With dishes washed and camp packed up, I was soon back on the trail. I had around 5 miles to cover before reaching paved roads, and I enjoyed every single one of those miles. The drive out was easy but scenic and featured more rolling meadows. Eventually, I made it to Highway 261. At this point, I had been aired down for 4 days, so I needed to air up before hitting the highway. Of course, at over 9,000 feet, this takes a little more time than normal. I was soon back on the road and on my way back to Phoenix. This trip had been incredible. While a little bit different and a little bit slower paced, it had been great to relax and take in the scenery in what is, hands down, one of the best places in Arizona. While some things were certainly unplanned, the weather had been great the trails were fantastic, and my six-day adventure had absolutely flown by. From some rough spots in an old mine in Tonto National Forest, to high elevation lookouts and meadows in the White Mountains, I was glad to have returned to Eastern Arizona for this trip. I would highly recommend you check the area out if you ever get the chance. That's going to be it for this special. If you're interested in some of the trails we did, you can check some of them out over on our website at azoffroad.net forward slash offroad trails. I really do appreciate you watching this series, and as always, we'll be back with more specials, historic spots, and Jeep projects in the near future. We'll see you on the next one. And we don't want to poop in the woods. Extra cheese. Little uh, little tidbit there. story if you're gonna have to change a tire it may as well be somewhere as pretty as the White Mountains so can't complain <laughs> the elevation's killing me though but can't complain <laughs>